Did you ever hear that old saying that it ain't worth a lick or he ain't worth a lick? Do you know where that saying comes from? I hope you never hear that at work from your boss or something like that. That probably wouldn't be a good thing. You know, on Friday morning, I woke up about uh, 3 a.m. and I checked my cows because it's calving season out at the farm. And I try to check them every night, about every two or three hours, to see if there's any problems or if any of them need help or in distress. And I saw this young first-time mom, this first calf heifer, they call him, was having trouble. So I woke up my two 12-year-olds because I knew I'd probably need help. I was kind of afraid to wake up my wife. You know, <laughs> might not go over too well at home, you know. Although she doesn't, help, uh, she doesn't mind helping when, when we need help around the farm. But I think it's important to wake up my kids and help them see this miracle of life and to, to give me a hand when I need help on the farm. You know, my children and my grandchildren know what's inside that cow or the goat or the lamb or any other thing that's going to have a baby, including people. It's a baby. It's a new life. It's a miracle of God. Not a choice, not a fetus, not something, it's, it's not something that we can just throw away. It's something in there that's extremely valuable. And they know that their dad or grandpa, whoever I am, whoever's watching me, will do anything I can to save that little baby. So we hooked up these OB straps to the calf and we helped the young mother, the young cow, pull this calf out to get the calf out. It took us about 15 minutes of hard work to get the calf out. But it was fine, it was a little boy. And as we cleaned off, I made sure it was breathing okay and I pulled it around to the front of the, the cow to let it bond to it, to let it lick it. But the mom was hurting. This hurt a little bit to have this baby. And the baby was all slimy and kind of icky. The cow wanted nothing to do with this new baby. The calf was not worth a lick. It wouldn't lick it. That's where that saying comes from. So I took some molasses that I have in the farm and I kind of poured a little bit of molasses on it. It like, would be like a Snickers bar of candy on the baby. And the calf licked it a little bit, but then stopped. So I took it a, bucket, a small bucket of grain and I poured the grain over and I rubbed it all over the baby. And the cow chose it and licked it and licked it clean and said, ah, it's not so bad, and fell in love with her new baby. It was a great thing to see that it was now worth a lick. And it bonded to the baby and fell in love with it. You know, in today's gospel, Jesus tells us a story about a fig tree. The fig tree is not bearing fruit, and the gardeners had it. The, the, the landowners had it. And he tells the gardener, just cut the thing down. It's not worth a lick. However, the gardener, who is Jesus in this story, and we are the fig tree, says, give it some more time. I will fertilize it. I will cultivate it. I will take really good care of it and prune it. And after all this, next year, if that tree doesn't bear fruit, then you can cut it down if you want. You see, God thinks we're worth a lick. He gives us every chance to bear fruit, to be good, productive Christians, and to bring ourselves and others to Christ. God loves us, and we are worth a lick. We are worth everything, even his son dying on the cross for us to save us. However, according to this gospel, we must participate. We are this fig tree, and we must produce good fruit. We must repent of our bad habits. It says in the gospel three different times, repent, repent, repent. We must repent and get rid of those bad habits and sins and get on our knees and pray and bring others to Christ to bear good fruit. Jesus is this master gardener and will care for us with love and tenderness. He will prune us, that's what reconciliation is, to get rid of those bad things and to cut off those dead branches. And then he feeds us on our family table, the altar, with his own body and blood, spiritually to make us strong and healthy so we're able to go out these doors and produce good fruit. But, like this parable says, there will come a time after the gardener has given us every chance that he possibly could, that we, we must produce fruit or we're going to be cut down and thrown out. This is a hard teaching. Those of us or some people we might know who are currently just kind of going through the motions and doing just the minimum they can and not producing good fruit, we should be worried. Which aspects of your life, your career, or relationships, or activities are bearing good fruit? Can you fertilize, prune, and cultivate your spiritual life to make your tree 
bear better fruit? And here's a question that I heard from a good priest quite a few years ago to actually help me choose to become a deacon and get more involved with my church. And I've always remembered it because it challenged me and made me better. What if everyone in the church was like you? What if everyone in the church was like you? Would this be a better church? Wow, that's a tough question, isn't it? Have you ever felt maybe that you weren't worth a lick? I know I have a couple times in my life, especially when I was a teenager. I had a teacher and a coach that told me that I wasn't worth a lick, and it hurt me. Luckily for me, I also had some great teachers that told me I was worth something and encouraged me, and a great mother and father and grandparents that helped me be better and get over that when people tell you you're not good or not the way you should be. And to know that Jesus, the gardener, is there for us all the time to help us on our journey to God and to help our tree bear good fruit. In the first reading, we see Moses. He felt like he wasn't worth a lick, too, you know. He was abandoned. He committed murder. He was exiled to a foreign land. And later in in the book of Exodus, we see he couldn't speak very well, and he told God, why me? I'm not even worth a lick. I'm not worth it. Pick somebody else. But God loved him with all his imperfections, and God called Moses to lead his people. God thought Moses was worth a lick, and he called Moses up this holy mountain for prayer, humbleness, and repentance. And if God can forgive uh, and call people like Moses, like Peter and the other apostles and a lot of the great saints, he can do something with us. You know, this church is a holy mountain. This church is where God is. This church is where mercy and forgiveness reign. Jesus is waiting for us to welcome us, and he's waiting to forgive us. He will give us a second, a third, a hundred chances, a thousand chances if we need them to make us be better fruit. He thinks that we're worth a lick. And Jesus commands us to bear good fruit, to lead people to him. And if we, if we don't go out and make disciples of all nations, he tells us we'll suffer a tragic end. So like Moses and like Jesus' example, like a lot of the apostles, he asks us to come to him in humbleness, to bow down, to take off your sandals because we're on holy ground and repent and be humble and come to him. So like Jesus and Moses, we got to take examples of this humbleness to bear good fruit to others, to bring others to Christ and encourage them and encourage ourselves to bear better fruit, especially in this time of Lent.